Well, hello everyone and welcome to Painless Universal, a conversation with myself and Welsh. Today I'm truly excited because I'll be talking to you about anxiety pain. So many people have suffered the anxiety pain, especially after the pandemic happened. That left so many people feeling confused, depressed, anxious, leading on to severe anxiety pain. And not many people not even knowing they have it. They just felt it probably this is normal, probably this is just something I'm going through. But anxiety pain, I must say, it is absolutely real. And I'll be talking to a very special guest, Dr. Russell Kennedy, who will be telling us about the symptoms of anxiety pain, why he started his own journey about dealing with anxiety pain, not from the traditional methods, but from other unique methods that worked exclusively for him, which he now uses on his clients. Who is my guest? Dr. Russell Kennedy specializes in the art and neuroscience of helping people recover from anxiety disorder. He knows anxiety from inside out as he developed his own anxiety disorder as a result of growing up with his dad. Dr. Kennedy has degree and advanced training in medicine, neuroscience and development psychology. That is not all science, he says as he is also a certified yoga and meditation teacher. He was also once a professional stand-up comedian for over a decade. Wow, that'll be interesting. He's got a new book out, which is called The Anxiety RS, which shows practical, actionable program for people for anxiety release, which you can incorporate into your daily lives. Dr. Kennedy will be giving us a unique experience that has never been seen or done before. And he wants to make sure that everyone who suffers with anxiety, as he did, will find joy at the end of the tunnel. Let's meet our doctor as we discuss the anxiety pain and how we could tackle it. Meet Dr. Russell Kennedy. Well, hello everyone and welcome to Painless Universal, a conversation with myself and Welsh. Anxiety pain is everywhere, especially since the pandemic, more and more people are suffering from anxiety pain. As I said in my introduction, today's topic is all about dealing with your anxiety and finding your joy. Our guest today is Dr. Russell Kennedy. And he will be telling us about his own journey, why he started it. He's not just a doctor, but he's also a doctor who's experienced it himself. So he's using his own traditional method to help others. How are you, Dr. Russell Kennedy? How I'm are you doing, today? I'm doing great, Anna. Thanks for asking. Good. I'm so glad you are because this um, this topic is such a, you know, it, it can't be any, any more relevant in today's world is that anxiety pain. I think so many people, in fact, in the UK, for example, we're dealing with the Indian variant. And so many people are now getting more nervous and anxious about what does this entail? Does this mean that the little bit of lockdown we've experienced is going to go away? So yeah, right. so where everyone is always uh, in that, um, that nervous. Where are you joining me from today? I live in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, which is pretty close to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm on the west coast of Canada. So I'm about eight hours behind you in London. Okay. So um, to really start, um, Dr. Kennedy, I think we'll, I would love to start but, um, backwards. I always like to go to the beginning. Who are sure. you? Well, let's see. Uh, it's a complicated <laughs> question, I guess. Uh, I am uh, the son of... Uh, father who was schizophrenic and bipolar. My mother was a registered nurse originally from Glasgow, but emigrated to Canada in 1958, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, my early life was, it was fairly uneventful. You know, my mother worked a lot. My father um, didn't get really, really sick until I was about probably 10 or 11 years old. So my mother uh, looked after the family. She did all the laundry, all the cleaning, all the everything. And then, um, and my father was sometimes great and very kind and loving and attentive. And, you know, taught me how to hit a ball and ride a bike and all that kind of stuff. 
And other times he was just absent. You know, he was psychologically absent. He was either, you know, bipolar in a manic phase where he was up for three or four days at a time or, or in this terrible depression where he'd just be in his room, like in a dark room for days at a time. And as a child, you don't really know what to make of that. You know, my mom did her best to sort of shield me from it as, and my brother from it as best she could. But there is this kind of, you know, you know, as a child, there's something not right. Like there's not something not right in your family, even though you don't have other, you know, households to really compare it to. But you know that there's something wrong. And typically as children, what happens is if there's something wrong in the household, children can't blame the parents because the parents are omnipotent. So they wind up blaming themselves in some way and they make themselves at fault in some way. And that's, I think the real, that's where anxiety really starts because I think anxiety is, uh, all anxiety is separation anxiety. Uh, I heard that from Dr. Gordon Neufeld, who's one of my mentors. He's a developmental psychologist. Mm -hmm. So all, all anxiety is separation anxiety. And it's mostly, you know, I added this on and it's mostly separation from yourself. And I think it starts when we're younger, if there's trauma in our household, we kind of do this split from ourselves where we're no longer the ones that are just solely being taken care of. We kind of have to look at taking our taking care of our parents too, or that our needs don't come first anymore. And I think that's that sows the seeds for anxiety later on in life. I really do. Yeah, that's, that was what I was going to ask you that with your dad's illness, do you think that led on to your own anxiety, which you said you had to you suffered for many years? Do you think that was part of it? Oh yeah, for sure. Part of it was um, in a way that I couldn't trust love. And I think if you look at a lot of people that struggle with anxiety in their childhood, specifically, they had a place where they couldn't trust love. Mm -hmm. So my dad was very attentive, nurturing and loving at points, but he would also become very distant when he was schizophrenic or if he'd become bipolar or manic or, or depressed. So there was this sense that all of a sudden I had this nurturing parent you know, same sex parent who looked after me. And then all of a sudden he was gone. So there was this sense like, you know, can I really trust love? Is love safe to trust? And then I think as you get older, you carry that with you. So part of me was paranoid. I was going to get the same illness he did for one. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's contributed a lot to becoming an anxious because even though I didn't develop schizophrenia or bipolar, thankfully, I, I developed an anxiety disorder because I worried about it so much. Yes. Yeah, you know, one thing I, I, I'm always baffled when it comes to anxiety is that I don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, I, I'm always confused when people say the word anxiety because I just think it's something that is short term that don't worry, you get, get over your stress and and it would be better soon. Don't worry about it. So, but now I see there's a big push towards anxiety. And I would I really love it to come for and you to help me here. What is anxiety and how how do we know we're suffering from anxiety? Yeah, it's funny, you know, because I get messages every day from people who have read my book and said, I had no idea I had anxiety until I read your book. And it's like, well, I don't know if I did you any favors there, but but uh but it is one of those things, I, th I think anxiety in and of itself, like words have consciousness to them. And I don't think anxiety as a word has that much consciousness to it. I think the word alarm has a tremendous amount of consciousness to it. So I think that what we call anxiety of the mind is really a stored sense of alarm, an energy in our body of feeling off balance, um, unloved, unsafe as children. And I think what happens is that creates an energy that gets lodged in our body. There is a theory that the body is the representation of the unconscious mind. And I think that's what happens. We get this alarm stored in our body. And a lot of people that I work with, I get them to find the alarm in their body and, and rename and, and use the, the word alarm instead of the word anxiety. So if you're out for lunch, with a friend and they don't have a clue of what anxiety is and you say i'm feeling alarmed today they'll know because everybody's felt alarmed at one point in their lives they know so they'll then they have a point of reference but if you just say i'm feeling anxious or i'm feeling anxiety or suffer from anxiety a lot of people who haven't suffered from anxiety won't have a clue of what you're talking about but if you say i'm feeling alarmed 
which is really at its core, at its consciousness level, at its core, that's what anxiety is. It's a sense of alarm that's stored in the body that the mind and the mind being a make sense meaning making machine, it constantly reads your internal and external environment. And if it reads that alarm in your system, that uncomfortable emotion in your system, it's going to make a, a story that's completely consistent with that uncomfortable alarm. So it's gonna develop worries. It's gonna want warnings, what ifs, worst case scenarios. It's just your, your mind is essentially operating normally under the situation of, of this perceived threat. Wow. Yeah, and that's a good way to um, really explain it because I, I I totally didn't know what anxiety was because can can anxiety be seen as a chronic illness as well? Absolutely. I mean, until you deal with that, see, I carry a lot of alarm in my system from growing up with a father who was mentally ill. Right. Mm -hmm. Some people have an alcoholic for a father. Some people have a narcissistic parent, like a narcissistic mother, mm -hmm. and they don't get their needs met. So that turns into this alarm this energy of alarm that gets stored in our bodies. And that's, that's what reverberates. That's what goes in. The mind is a much more passive organ than we think it is, you know? So, so it reads the body. And if the body is alarmed, the mind will come up with stories that, that make sense of that alarm. And when it makes up stories that make sense of that alarm that are alarming, it creates more alarm in the body because the body really doesn't know the difference between a story that you're telling yourself and whether it's, whether it's really happening. So mm -hmm. if you start thinking, oh, you know, if you start having, uh, you know, some cramps in your stomach and you go, oh, I've got cancer, I must have cancer. Well, of course, that's going to create more alarm in your mind. Yes. It also brings you into, from a neuroscience point of view, it also, excuse me, drops you out of your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that, that really soothes you and sees the rational world the way it actually is, or at least as best we can and the survival brain, which is kind of like between your ears. So you fall into survival brain. And by definition in survival brain, you don't have the ability to reason anymore. So anything that your mind comes up with looks more true because you've lost the rational part of your brain. So when you come up with these crazy worries and your brain believes them, it's because your brain was impaired. So, and oftentimes too, like there is a theory that when you suffer a trauma as a child, part of you stays at that age. So if you were, you know, abused or abandoned or whatever at nine years old, mm -hmm. when you face that in your adult life, say your, your partner gets angry at you and leaves the house, it reminds you of your minds, your, your body of the same trauma that you went through when a parent left you when you were nine years old. So you revert back to a nine-year-old and you start acting like a nine-year-old, but you don't know it. You don't know that you reverted back to a nine-year-old. So that's why, you know, it's like you say to your partner later, I don't know what came over me. Like, I just went a little nuts there, you know? And it's like, yeah, because you both, re you regress back to a nine-year-old. And if you trigger your partner, they will regress back to their trauma. So it's like two nine-year-olds trying to solve a problem when, you know, on the playground, when, one, when they're both really upset, you're not going to be able to do that. No, I love that. I, I actually, when you think when you think about it, it does happen that way. When things happen to you, you actually reverse back to remember the bad other thing that happened to you when you were much younger, and it's true. And it does play a bad part in your life. Yeah, I love and you might not even you might not even be aware of it, and that's the thing. I think a lot of our trauma is unconscious, right? It's it's, it's held in our body. It's not consciously available to us, mm. so we will see things that remind us, like I will see a picture of my dad and it will trigger me, you know, it'll trigger me back to the time where, you know, he was in the mental hospital and he was really suffering and, and, uh, or he was at the house, he wasn't hospitalized. And, you know, I would kind of take a look after him because mom was working and, you know, it kind of the, I was the oldest boy. So it kind of fell on me to look after him. So I think that was the, the genesis of me becoming a doctor because I, I had the sense of being inflated by this idea of like, oh, I'm 12 years old now. I'm an adult. I'm looking after my dad. And that really, I think, sowed the seeds for me to become a doctor later on. You took recovery in your own hands, you know. Um, mm -hmm. when, 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 when you were going for your own anxiety, you didn't say, okay, I'm just going to go for the traditional method. I will try and figure things out. And that I think sometimes is much needed because myself, I have a chronic illness. And the only way I got better, even though doctors said, oh, you, you don't tend to get better from sickle cell anemia. I had to get better because I just had to take recovery into my own hand. I was tired of being in hospital and doing all that. And so I did that. 
And with your anxiety, you decided to take your own recovery into your own hands. You used the other method. You said you had a unique method, different from the traditional method, but your own experience in India of healing yourself. Could you explain this to me about your journey in India and how that made such a huge difference based and compared to the rest of the other journeys you've been through? Well, I, I mean, I, I've been seeking help for my anxiety since I've been 20 years old. Right. I'm 60 now. So it's, it's been a long road. Right. So, so it's been a long road. So, so I, 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 I saw the psychiatrist, I saw the psychologist, I saw EMDR, I saw tapping, I saw, you know, ACT therapy, I saw, you know, CBT therapy, I did all those things. And then I felt terrible because none of them, re they helped initially, but they didn't help long term. So after about 30 years of do, doing this, I realized, oh, <clears throat> physician heal thyself. Like I'm gonna have to do this myself. So I went to India and I studied kind of like the science of spirit there. Cause I'm, I'm a scientist at heart, even though I have my, my woo woo flaky side and I'm a yoga and meditation teacher as well. But at my core, I'm a, a skeptical scientist. So I went to India and then I, I really saw a different way of looking at life in general, just because of the poverty there for one. Mm. Um, and just really sort of say, showing myself that, that a lot of life was just perception. Yes. And I remember having a patient of mine uh, email me years and years ago, and, she, and this is in the book. And she said, um, Dr. Kennedy, I'm running out of my anti-anxiety medication and I need a refill on my perception. Now, I guess it spell checked out for, but what she wanted to say was I need a refill on my prescription. Yeah. So I, I emailed her back because, you know, I, I had a pretty good uh, relationship with my patients. And I said, you know what, if I could really refill your perception, you probably wouldn't need the prescription. Right? I love that. <laughs> So it was like, and that's basically kind of, so all this stuff started to come up and, and India, like I, I had a moment of in, like enlightenment for 90 minutes on a rooftop, but India in and of itself, I think it was a stepping stone, but it wasn't all of a sudden this, you know, amazing opening up. I think what really, what really pushed me over the edge was psychedelics. So I had a friend who's, you know, kind of a specialist in, in plant medicine. So he took me on a, a journey with LSD and then I went on a journey with ayahuasca. And basically it just showed me, this is what showed this sort of academic medical doctor that my anxiety was actually located in my solar plexus. It was in my chest. Um, I had this vision that it was purple and sharp and it was like stalagmites in a cave, like pointing, pushing up and then it pushes up against my heart. So whenever I get alarmed, that's the feeling that I get. And so it was like, okay, well, if this is the cause, as opposed to the anxious thoughts, how do I fix this? So I fix it by connecting with it for one, because I think on, on some level, it's asking for my attention. You know, it's the part of me that got, that didn't get his attachment needs met when he was little. Mm -hmm. So it's my job as an adult to meet his attachment needs now. So this evolved over two or three years. Like I did LSD, I did psychedelics. And then I went to a conference with Dr. Neufeld, who's one of my, my mentors in developmental psychology. And, and he said, all anxiety is separation anxiety. And then he mentioned the word alarm. And he mentioned it in a different context, but, but I thought, well, what if this thing that I saw on LSD was actually, is actually a state of alarm that's held in my body? And it's not so much my mind. So I started working from that point of view. And then I really started focusing on, okay, well, how do I heal this? How do I connect with this? And then I kind of realized that that alarm was my younger self around 12 years old that mm -hmm. did need attention, connection, attachment, and didn't get it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of asking, you know, your alarm or your anxiety or whatever you'd like to call it is asking for your attention now that it didn't get back then. So that's kind of what I saw on LSD and to, lesser, to a lesser extent ayahuasca was that I wasn't paying enough attention to this younger part of me that was still inside of me and it was still hurting. And so I really had to sort of bring him into attention. I got a picture of, you know, I've got a picture of uh, a him when he was younger. I put it up in my bathroom. I talked to him, you know, I know this sounds crazy, but uh, I talked to him, I connect with him. I really, I re cause I really do believe the root of anxiety is actually this sense of alarm of not getting your attachment needs met as a child. 
And your job is to first find the alarm. And this is all in the book um, is find the alarm and then connect with it because yeah. that's the part that needs the healing. You can, you can ha- you can fix all the thoughts you want. And the way I draw the analogy is it's like, if, if you have anxiety, it's like you're in a rowboat and it's filling up with water and you can go to talk therapy and you can bail out water and, and it'll make you feel better. But unless you fix that hole in the boat, unless you fix that hole in the hull of the boat, you're always going to be bailing water. You're always going to be going to therapist appointment. You're always going to be trying to manage this condition rather than fix it at its core, which is basically fixing the hole in the boat. And the hole in the boat is getting in touch with that alarm, seeing, you know, does it have a shape? Does it have a color? Does it have a, is it, is it well-defined? You know, the more things that you can do to identify it, the more you can connect with that younger version of yourself that's really crying out for your attention. And one last thing, I know I'm talking really quickly here, but what happens is that when we feel that alarm, what most adults do and what most of us do is we go back up into our heads. So instead of going through the alarm to connect with that younger version of ourselves, we go to the alarm, we feel it, we go, oh, I don't like this at all. So when we go up into our heads and then we start overthinking and ruminating, because what that does is it keeps us in our heads and it keeps us out of that place in our body that hurts. So why, if, if we're storing this pain in our, in our, in our gut or our, our, our chest or our heart or our throat, why would we want to go back down there? Because it really hurts. It's much easier to ruminate, stay in your head, overthink, all that kind of thing in the short term than it is to actually deal with the problem. So a lot of people wind up going to therapy and talk therapy for 20, 30, 40 years. I get people virtually every day saying, I've learned more from you in the last 90 minutes than I've heard in the last 10 years of therapy. Yeah, so I, and I tend I, I tend to kind of ramble, Anne, so you gotta- No, you, you don't, you don't. Because you, I was gonna say, actually, I've learned so much from what you've just said about the whole, the way the body and the mind processes things and everything. But while you uh, while you had this beautiful trip to India, right? Where they are the methods. Because for me, I I always remember my method of coping when I had my own. Um, I call it my own aha moment. My sickle cell was that I heard other people tell me, especially someone I really looked up to. My mentor said to me, "Why are you feeling pity in yourself? Why do Why are you doing this? Look at other people. Some people don't even have kind of afford shoes. They can't afford basic." And you are here beating yourself up because anxiety is always about because you can't do what you wanted to do or because someone you saw, you know, just all different levels of yeah. it for me. I yeah. feel that brings anxiety. But this mentor of mine said, look, and whenever you go down, think of the others. Think of people who don't even kind of even get from A to B, don't even know where the food is coming from, don't even know where water is coming yeah. from. And your trip to India, you, you hit a core there with me because I, 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 I'm surprised that actually someone actually utilized that method as well, which is something you've done with your trip to India. You actually utilize that method of actually looking at others and seeing that there's a lot of po- their poverty in India. And at the same time, as much as there's wealth, there's also lots of poverty and you realize what you have and what are you angry about. Did, were there some, some coping or preventative mechanism that you learned along the way during your journey in India? I think it was just to live in my body. You know, like the smells are different there. The food was different there. Mm-hmm. Like just, it really took me out of this kind of North American privilege and mm-hmm. into this place where there's, I had to, I had to focus on my senses because things were so different. They were just so different. And here's the thing, like a lot of times, if you look at like second and third world countries, they have lower rates of anxiety and depression than we do in sort of the UK, North America, Absolutely. because they they feel connected to each other. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a sense of connection there that we don't have here. We have so much choice that we're overwhelmed by choice. So in a way, yes, we have lots of privilege and I wouldn't want it the other way. But the thing is having too much choice for the human brain can be very, very stressful. You know, so I think that it's, a, it's like when you go to the to the or you go pick a movie, you know, like you have probably 500 brilliantly directed filmed movies and yet you're frozen. Like you sit there, it's like I'm frozen. I can't figure out which of these movies I want to watch because you yeah. have so much choice. And, and, you know, you said it earlier on, like uncertainty is the mother of anxiety and mm-hmm. it's how how we handle uncertainty. 
So if uncertainty for you was really as a child, not you personally, but collectively, mm -hmm. uh, if uncertainty was, was a big factor in your childhood, as you get older, uncertainty is going to be a bigger factor in your adulthood as well. And un uncertainty will also trigger you in back into this state of alarm. So it's learning how on some level to embrace uncertainty. And I think that's what, what uh, India did for me was it made me embrace the uncertainty of just life in general. Yes. You know, it was just, there was no, you know, it, but they were just happy in the moment. And I think that we, you know, we live in this kind of privileged place where it's like, well, what do you want to do? Well, I would like to be a doctor. I would like to do this. And, and really it is one of those things that, that we really have to look at and, and live every day in our bodies because the body is where, where, where life is. You know, I've, I've been in on, I've assisted on neurosurgeons uh, or, or neurosurgeries where we can cut right into the brain. The brain has no pain fibers whatsoever. It's the body that feels the pain and it's the body where life is. So if you have trauma that you've got stored in your body as alarm and you don't want to go back down there, if you live in your head, you're really not living life. And I think what India did for me was it made me really, you know, smell the air, look around, see, see how everything was different, be in my body because, and that's when you're in your body, that's where life is. And it can be freaking painful too, but that's, everything goes together, you know, the glory, the pain, the whatever it's in your body. It's not in your mind. And we're so mind fixated. We worship the mind so much in North American and, and, and British society mm -hmm. that, that, that we, we lose the body. We lose where life is. And we start thinking, well, what if I have that? I'll have that in two years. Or maybe I'll have that in four years or whatever. I'll, I'll get married. I'll have my first kid at, you know, 31. I say, you know, we plan everything out and we lose the day. Yeah. Because, and a lot of people with anxiety, we lose the day because we're afraid to go back into our body. So we live in our heads and there's not, there's a, a limited amount of, of pleasure and fulfillment that you'll get out of your head. Yes. Live in the, live in the body. I love, I just, I just love that perspective because there's something that so many of us miss out on and it's taking us away from that enjoyment of life. Live for the day, enjoy what the life, life has to offer and see it, smell the air, smell even if it's raining, enjoy, I don't know. But we just get caught up in planning every, in a, planning to the T. But I think the whole pandemic has really brought us to some kind of real, realization that we can't plan everything. Everything can't be under our control. We can't book our flight. We can't plan when we're going to get married. We can't plan when we're having kids because we just don't know. As much as we thought before, we all knew this, but not really. And I think um, it's something I'm, I'm, I, people say, why do you say this? But I say, I think I'm enjoying it a little bit. I enjoyed the pandemic because it brought us back to humanity a bit, brought us back to that sense of what is life? Why are we so anxious? Why are we so frightened about tomorrow? Well, not everyone knows. So you, you, what you're doing is so, you know, it's really great. But let's talk about your book. Your book is so great. I started, read, I started reading it. I just read a little bit because um, waiting for Amazon to send it over has been taking sure. a while. But I always finish my, the book because I think everyone needs to know. You wrote this Anxiety Rx. And this book really tells a real good picture about from start to the end, about methods, how to cope in mechanism, how to deal with anxiety, things to do day to day. What led you to write your book? Well, I just, I don't want anyone to suffer with anxiety the way I did. You know, I really, really don't. I mean, I, I've said that many, many times mm -hmm. is that I know how painful it is to live in that you know, eight hour panic attack for a day where you don't know where it's going to end. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that was the worst part about it is I didn't know how to fix it. I was a doctor and I, I couldn't fix it. And all the other doctors that I saw couldn't fix it either because medical doctors in general are not that great at mental health issues, mm -hmm. psychiatrists aside, but me medical doctors were not trained in it. We're certainly not trauma trained for one. And we're just, we just don't understand this. We're, we're, we come from a very reductionist perspective as medical doctors. So we believe that anxiety is in the mind and we can fix it with the mind. And I think that's the reason why we have such poor outcomes with anxiety. I mean, CBT is very highly effective in the short term, you know, but a year later, 
People tell me that I'm right back to the same anxiety that I was before, if not worse, because I went through this, you know, 16 week CBT program. And now I'm worse than I was even before I started. So it's kind of like, how, how is this going to work? So I had to fix it for myself. And I think that's what, I think that's why I was kind of gifted this anxiety in a way is to help other people with it. Because, you know, I do have a degree in neuroscience. I do have master's level training in developmental psychology. I do have a doctorate in medicine. That's all great from the academic side, but I'm also a yoga and meditation teacher. I'm also a stand-up comedian. So I have this sort of left brain, right brain approach to it. And I had to find out what worked for me. And really doing that, that, that trip on LSD, going to India, doing ayahuasca, it just really showed me that the way that we're looking at trying to treat and heal anxiety isn't working. You know, it works in the short term. Absolutely. You go to your therapist, you feel better, you walk out of there, you've got some, you've got some tools. But the thing is, you have to be rational enough to use those tools, right? So, so if you're not, if you go into anxiety, by definition, you get dropped into survival physiology, survival brain. So all the cognitive strategies we've taught you in CBT and talk therapy they're gone. They're not even accessible to you at that point. So the point where you need them the most is the point where they leave you. Now you can practice and, and, and there's certainly something to, I'm not against CBT at all. I think it's very helpful and very effective in many ways, yeah. but we really have to start incorporating the body in the healing of the mind. Because if we don't do that, if we don't fix the hole in the boat, we're never going to get we're never going to get to a point where we're, we're healed. I still get anxiety. I still get a lot. I should say alarm. I should use my own terminology. I still get alarmed. But what the way I've done with it now is I've reframed it into, into saying, okay, this is a signal that you have to get connected to yourself. This isn't a signal for you to go up in your head and start, you know, worrying around. This is a, this is a signal for you to get connected to your own self. So now when I get alarmed, it's like, it's not as alarming as it used to be because I don't go into my mind. Mm -hmm. If I go right into my body, I sit there and, I, and I, I, I'm very focused on staying in my body, staying in the moment, staying with my breath and really being compassionate to myself. You know, that's, that's what I find with, with mindfulness. Mindfulness is wonderful, but I always, I always get frustrated with mindfulness because it's like, you're right on the, you're right on the doorstep. You brought yourself into the moment. You're in the present. You're feeling, you're feeling your body. Now it's like, how can you be compassionate to yourself? How can you connect with that younger version of yourself? Like you're right there. You're right there. You know, why don't you just take it that one step further and go, okay, I'm really in the moment right now. What do I need? Like, what is that child in me? Who feels, uh, who feels worried and scared of the uncertainty, what does he need? What can I give him or her? Yes. What can I do? So that's, that's really my philosophy on it. And I really want to change the way the world, especially you know, therapists, physicians, look at anxiety and start incorporating somatic therapy. My wife is a somatic trauma therapist. So I've learned a ton from her. Like she's, she's shown me so much and, and I, I'm thinking about doing my own training in somatic experiencing as well. And I already kind of do that, but, but it's really important for me to sort of get it out there, get the word out there that we have to start incorporating the body in the healing of the mind. So do you think more people should talk about anxiety? Would that make it more understood if more people start talking about it? I think more people should start talking about alarm. Absolutely. Yeah. Because that's really what it is. I mean, it's really this, this stuff. I mean, everyone has anxiety, you know, everyone has anxiety. It's, it's to the point where, you know, someone says, uh, unless you're a, a really uh, adept public speaker, you know, you're, when someone says you have to speak in front of an audience, you're going to get anxious. Now I'm talking about people that had real uncertainty when they were, when they were younger. And uncertainty for them now is excruciating. So the people that I deal with are people that anxiety affects them every, you know, every day, every day anxiety affects them. And, and everybody gets anxious. I mean, the pandemic is one of those things that creates a lot of anxiety in people. But I'm talking about the, the anxiety that, that pushes people to suicide, that pushes people so far over the edge that they can't cope anymore. And, and everything in between. So there's definitely, even if you are, you know, we're, if, if you don't have a trauma background and you're still sort of anxious about kind of life in general, you can use these tools to kind of get into your body, start really realizing where life is. So time doesn't seem like it flies by so much. You know, when you live in your body, time goes slower. 
Yeah. You know, with the social media, um, that I think for much younger people, that's made anxiety more much worse. Um, totally. The, um, the alarm, as you say, it's made it yeah. much worse. How can we, um, the younger generation especially, but I think everyone, yeah. how can we understand that trigger point of the alarm is setting in because of things we've read and seen on social media? And how, I think it, how can we do yeah. that? I think it's really, especially with young people, it's really introducing them to where they feel the anxiety in their body. Like really some, some kids will find it in their gut. Some people will find it in their sinus solar plexus, others in their heart area, others in their throat, others across their shoulders. There's certain patterns that I kind of see with people. If you feel the alarm in your gut, chances are when you were younger, you didn't get enough food or you didn't get or feel sheltered enough. In the solar plexus, it's more a, a sense of, of of abandonment. It's more a sense that you were rejected, bullied. That uh, in your heart, it's more of a sense of heartache, you know, loss, like a parent lo losing a parent or a parent being sick or not being there for you. In your throat, I see people that were never able to tell their parents how they felt. Like their parents were their parents were the ones that were so important that they couldn't express how they felt. And when people feel it across their shoulders, it, they had to sort of take on the, the role of, of being a, an adult in the family way too early. Those are generalizations, but it's just finding the alarm first and then realizing that, hey, maybe that alarm is my younger self. Maybe it is the part of me that kind of, you know, was experiencing a certain trauma and I kind of left, left myself behind. Because I said, as I said earlier, when you experience a trauma in life, part of you stays frozen at that age. So it's going back and finding that child and really reassuring them. And the thing about our children now is they're hooked on screens and okay. screens don't provide the social engagement that we need. Yes. There's part of our brain called the social engagement system. And, and it's a part of our brain and body and it uses eye contact, body language, facial expressions, uh, prosody of voice and tone of voice. So right now you and I are talking, we're feeling connected, you're smiling, I'm smiling, we're connected. Now that allows us, when we build that social engagement system in ourselves and our children, when we get stressed that our own social engagement system will calm us down. The thing with children is they're not getting the face-to-face -face contact that they need to mature the social engagement system. When I was young, I was out playing with my friends every day. We were laughing, crying, play fighting, whatever. We had the range of emotion and we could see it right there and feel it right there. Kids today don't have that. So they don't, we're not maturing that, that social engagement system in them. So when they come to have to, to soothe themselves, they don't have the machinery that's matured in there. And then on top of that, what makes everything worse is they go back to their screens because they feel unbalanced, they feel anxious. So they go back to the screens to try and soothe themselves, which it does because it creates this do dopamine hit when you get a like or your friend texts you or whatever, but it's not, it's not satisfying. It's not satisfying. So what happens is they, they, they have this sort of addicted to the screens kind of thing for something that's never going to satisfy them. So oxytocin is kind of like the hormone of a hug, right? You get a hug, you feel that kind of warm, everything's okay kind of thing. Kids these days aren't getting that because they're getting most of their, their most of the hits from dopamine, most of it from social media, and just the tremendous amount of comparison mm -hmm. uh, for kids these days. Of course, they're going to feel uncertain. Of course, they're going to feel anxious. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really a big thing hitting kids, especially those that, were, um, that suffered with the lockdown, um, not having oh. access to their friends. Our final question here is really about, you know, we, your work is so unique because you are not just doing it from the medical side, you are also doing it from your own experience. And you're also doing it from the experience of going to India, for example, to learn in different methods and seeing it from different places. So you've, you're doing it from three aspects. What is your hope for the future in terms of merging these kind of um, lessons because it's always, I always, I always laugh at when someone who's gone through things speak, speak about it, because I think they speak from what they have felt and be able to give that a, a very, you know, deep advice from, okay, you're feeling this pain, I feel, I feel what you're feeling. I've been to India, I've done it a different way. I'm also studying it. What's your hope in combining that so people better understand the alarm? Yeah, I mean, I hope that we start embracing more somatic therapies. Dr. Peter Levine de developed this uh, 
this this program called somatic experiencing mm -hmm. which is basically using the body to heal the mind to access these old programs that sit in us from trauma and uh, my wife's trained in it. I'm thinking about training in it. I know a lot about it already because I've just, every time she watches one of her videos, I watch over her shoulder and we talk about it all the time. But my hope is that we start, we start embracing the body and the healing of the mind because we can't just do it with the mind. And I think, you know, I, I have a saying that says you, you can't fix a feeling problem with a thinking solution. You have to feel your way out. You have to feel it to heal it really. And my hope is that we start going a lot more internally. We start using the body a lot more in therapy. We start using it a lot more in day-to-day -day conversation. We start using the body as a way of saying, you know, how are you feeling right now? Where are you feeling that? It, you know, are you, are you feeling great? Great. Where are you feeling that? Like, how, describe that to me. Like, just really get into our senses because we're, we're getting into this place where we're getting so neck up. We're getting so cognitive that we're losing life. You know, there's a, there's a nucleus in the brain called the nucleus accumbens. And the short version of the nucleus accumbens is it, is it wants to want more than, it, more than it likes having. So the analogy, and this is from James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. And he says, so the analogy is you're a child on Christmas day or, or, or leading up to Christmas. There's a part of you that looks forward to more forward to opening your presence than actually appreciating your presence once you've got them. Yes. So as human beings, we are wired to want, which is great because it, it you know it gives us space travel, it gives us all these amazing things that human beings have have come from. But the problem is it's not satisfying. Just living in your head is not satisfying. So what I would hope for people is that we start getting a, a vocabulary and a language where we start talking about how are you feeling in your body? Like, how is that affecting you? How, how, how does embarrassment feel? How does this, and you know, being able to talk to it with a, a therapist or a counselor or your friends or your partner or whatever, just developing this vocabulary of being able to, to express what's happening in your body. Cause that's where life is. We try and explain things so much and there's only so much other people can understand with words. But like I said, when we started out talking today, you know, not a lot of people know what anxiety is. Well, a lot of people do, but many people don't, mm -hmm. but everyone knows what alarm is. Everyone knows what alarm feels like. So if we start getting into the body and we start really being able to develop, to develop this language around feeling, I think as a society, we'll get a lot more healthy. Um, Dr. Russell Kennedy, I really appreciate your time for today and talking us through the anxiety pain and how even if, well, no matter if you, whatever you, ever you're going through, you can still find your joy. But it is hard because like you said, you're still dealing with your little challenges here and but there is hope because when we look at you, we're all happy and we know that there is hope at the end of the tunnel. And I think that's what people want to hear, that it's not all bad, that they could cure this one way or the other. And I think I would encourage everyone to read your book as well, because you really are going through it in more details. And I think you explain method of doing it um, day by day, how to cope with anxiety. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome, man. Thanks so much.